Hello everyone, I'm Zach, and today I'm looking at the story of a mentally disturbed man caring for his mother and responding to a corrupt, uncaring world with increasingly unhinged acts of violence. No, not that one. This one. It's kind of hard to say whether or not Lynn Ramsey's You Were Never Really Here influenced Joker's decisions or not. They were made so close together that I'm sure there was vague production overlap and they adapt wildly different source material. As it's so hip to point out, both films are very reverent of the Martin Scorsese classic Taxi Driver, updating that film's post-Watergate cynicism to our current moment, even if one is a period piece. All three films heavily rely on score and cinematography to convey a particular mood and are bolstered by virtuoso central performances. McCleary said you were brutal. I can be. Still, it must be said they are very different films, with the similarities becoming increasingly superficial the more you compare them all. I usually do a brief synopsis around this point, though that hardly serves You Were Never Really Here, as it's a character-focused stream of consciousness more than anything. Here's one, anyway. What's undeniably impressive about Joaquin Phoenix is just how distinct he makes Joe and Arthur Fleck. He's not an actor who just has a crazy mode he activates when playing this type of character. He commands his physicality, mannerisms, and voice in impressive ways to create two fully realized and distinct people. Hey! I think Joker, love it or hate it, and You Were Never Really Here are reverent of Scorsese without toiling in his shadow. Lynn Ramsey's voice as a screenwriter, director, and editor turns the perhaps familiar beats of the latter film into something wholly unique, unsettling, and I will argue, literary. Taxi Driver and Joker both feature the protagonist talking to us about their mental state. By contrast, You Were Never Really Here simulates it in a way that could only be done with film. Joe's traumatic past as the child of an abusive home, a war veteran, and an FBI agent is woven seamlessly into the narrative with intelligently withholding sharp flashbacks that jarringly interrupt the action. They're usually brought on or triggered organically by some external stimuli, and often only last a couple of seconds, but we're able to discern so much from them. Cinematically, this is a strong way to show rather than tell what intrusive thoughts and PTSD are like for the sufferers. The edit is also married with poeticized and reoccurring voiceover, gentle counting to maintain composure, for example, or harsh words from Joe's father. Returning briefly to the photo scene, because there is a lot to break down and it may be my favorite scene in the film, technically. We have two levels of the film world here, Joe being asked to take a picture by a group of young women on the street, and a flashback to a disturbing incident of human trafficking gone wrong that he experienced with the FBI. The women being open-mouthed and wide-eyed like the corpses triggers the memory, but the real world also slowly distorts with Joe's mind, and a young woman he just met on the street represents, and in his mind becomes, one of the young women he failed to save. Both worlds or levels at play are suddenly tainted and distorted in a very confrontational fashion. Ramsey holds this shot for the longest 12 seconds there's ever been, with the woman staring directly at us as sounds from the flashback build. Joe's memories quite literally hijack the way he experiences the world and other people. Through cinematic language alone, Lynn Ramsey also imparts the idea that Joe and others are disembodied and invisible in today's overcrowded and manic world. She focuses on hands, legs, eyes, parts of people just hanging in limbo, rather than close-ups where we can conventionally see all of the actor. Joe is a specter, often just out of sight or out of frame, the chaos of his existence completely ignored. Ramsey has an excellent way of injecting just one off element into what would normally be a conventional scene of exposition or dialogue, such as a nosebleed or jelly beans. The reoccurring motifs of breathing and suffocation, or traffic and construction sounds in a simple establishing shot cranked up to a degree that they feel scary and oppressive. 
She focuses on the smallest aspects of a scene and makes them enormous and strange in a way that almost encourages reflection on our world from an alien's point of view. What Ramsey is doing is enacting organized violence on the everyday, the way Roman Jacobson says is emblematic of literature. Violence in the film is harrowing, but also seldom seen transpiring clearly. But it was terrifying. I've never done any action sequences. I've never done anything with a gun. It can feel really, you know, wacky when I was like, is this CSI? You know, like, you know, you just, like, can feel a little bit you're in that mo the language of movies. The, the way I saw it in my little script was the third is like a kind of post rage, you know, so you just see, you don't see what happens, you just see the aftermath. Excited to see me, huh? <laughs> you actually got me. The sensitive and subtle relationships between Joe and his ailing mother, as well as with Nina, the girl he rescues from an underground brothel, give the film a very strong emotional center that ensures all the directorial flair isn't for nothing. They're all damaged, traumatized people, but importantly, they're never one note. There's still people who sing, who laugh, who make jokes, and if they weren't, the story's tragic beats wouldn't land as well as they do. Johnny Greenwood of There Will Be Blood fame turns in another brilliant set of compositions here, experimentally veering from anxiety-inducing to mournful and reflective. Lynn Ramsey is a filmmaker to watch. Her filmography is genius, top to bottom, and this is a 90-minute roller coaster. I fundamentally do not understand how some people found it slow. Slow? This? This is slow? Come on, man. It is bleak and unsparing, absolutely, but it pushes the medium in such fascinating and memorable ways. While it picked up the Best Screenplay and Best Actor awards at Cannes in 2017, I had hoped it'd be a shoe in at the Oscars for, well, anything? For my money, this is a directorial tour de force, and a performance showcase for Joaquin, Judith Roberts, and Ekaterina Samsonov, as well as one of the very best films of the new millennium. You can check it out on Prime Video or on Blu-ray, which is pretty cheap at this point. If you enjoyed this video, a like or subscribe would help me out and go a long way. Next time I'll be taking a look at my favorite western to not take place in the Old West. Until then, everyone. <laughs>